Amen, amen. Church, we're preaching to the book of Romans, but this morning I'm going to ask you to open your Bible to the book of Joshua. If you're not sitting by an Awana child, I can show you where that's at. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Joshua. Jonathan, did you see that I sent that one slide up there? Joshua chapter 4 and verse 7 should be up there for you to pull up if you would, please, sir. I forgot to tell you. When you find Joshua, stand with me if you would. Joshua chapter 4. We're going to begin reading in verse 1, and when we get down to verse 7, we're going to read it off the monitor together. The children of Israel has come out of the Egypt. They've wandered 40 years in the wilderness, and now Joshua's about to lead them into the promised land that God had promised, the land of Canaan. Chapter 4, verse 1 begins, And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man for every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed for the children of Israel, one man for every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask you to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Read verse 7 with me, would you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. These stones shall be a remembrance of all that God has done forever. Now, Father, we stand this morning under the glory and blessing of your word. And, Father, we thank you for the remembrance you've given us, for all the things you've placed around us to remind us of who you are, your great love, and your goodness. Now, Father, we pray you would speak to our hearts today. Draw us to yourself. May we be built up and strengthened in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and be seated. This morning, as we get ready to take the Lord's Supper, we are thinking about the idea of remembering. A few uh, have gone out to the what I call the flag box out there, that uh, pyramid that's got the cross and the flags. You'll find an iron ore stone there with a memorial plaque on it. Uh, I took a picture so I could quote it. I don't know who wrote it. I may have. I don't remember. It says, if you woke up and read it, this rock of remembrance is placed here to celebrate the activity of God uniting pastor and people, July 2011, glory to God. Amen. There's times when we need helps to remember. I believe it's part of spiritual warfare that Satan wants us to forget the things of God, the goodness of God. He wants to bring into our remembrance all the time the, the places where we failed or the places where uh, life is hurt. But oftentimes, the remembering of God's goodness and of God's grace eludes us. Well, in all of the things that God has given us for remembrance, every time uh, there comes a storm and we see the rainbow, uh, we're reminded that God put it there to remind Him as to remind us that He'll never again destroy the earth by flood. Fire's coming but not flood. There were things that God put in people's lives. Uh, in the children of Israel, He put it the Sabbath day to remind them of God uh, creating all that is and that He's their God and He's their provider. The New Testament church worships on the first day of the week and it's still for us this day is a day of a reminder of who God is our God and we're His people and we're glad to be identified with Him. So all around us there's been remembrances but this morning, as we come to the Lord's Supper, Jesus said to His disciples, As oft as you do this, do this in remembrance of Me. Now, we do this uh, often in our church, six, seven times a year. And there's a lot of different things we remember. Oftentimes, our, rem our, our remembering is focused on Jesus and what He did. This morning, our remembering is going to be about the day we met Him. 
remembering the day we met him. Allowing that memory to bless us. Maybe that memory is long, long, long ago for you and you've been saved a really long time. Maybe that memory is fresh as the morning dew and you remember it just like it was yesterday. But this morning as we remember We do so because Jesus said in the Lord's Supper, I've placed in the church a rock of remembrance. And every time we do this, it is for that great glorious purpose of having our thoughts and our attentions turned solely to Him, the Son of God and His great redemptive work on Calvary for us. Spurgeon said it this way. He said, It appears almost impossible that those of us who have been redeemed by the blood of the dying Lamb and loved with an everlasting love by the eternal Son of God should forget the grace of Savior. It's almost unthinkable that we would forget, wouldn't it? Forget Him who poured His blood forth for our sins. The one who should make the abiding tenant of our memories is too often a visitor. The cross is desecrated by the feet of forgetfulness. We have to, all of our memories could honestly testify today that we do forget. There may be times, days, weeks go by that we don't consciously think on and remember who He is and all that He's done. So God, knowing us and knowing our need, He's placed in our midst a, a rock of remembering. And this morning, I've asked our deacons to help. I'm going to ask them to come on forward at this time if they would. This morning, we're going to drop here in the altar our rock of remembrance on remembering today that we gave our heart to Christ. Men, come on up and stand with me if you would. I've asked them to come and to share with you this morning at a way of remembering, to drop their rock of memorial, if you would, here with us on when they came to know Christ and how He saved their lives. Jonathan, I believe you're going to start us off. You know, I'm glad Brother Tony mentioned something about remembering because for me, Satan always tries to get me to forget. Mm -hmm. And for me, the date sometimes is a little more important. For everybody up here is going to have a dis- different testimony, and I've heard them all. But for me, Mom and Daddy brought me up in church, and I heard, but I didn't hear. And it was when I was invited to church my senior year in high school. Different church, not the one that Mom and Daddy brought me to or raised me up in, but a different one that I, I heard. And it got me thinking. And so I, I changed my life. And we talked about that a little bit in in life group today about um, good works, doing good, what might get you to heaven, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul. We we hit on that a little bit this morning in life groups about doing good. And I started acting good. I changed what I listened to. I changed the words that came out of my mouth. I changed my attitude. I changed a lot from when I was 17 to roughly almost 20. Hung out with church people. I did church things, I changed. But on August the 22nd, the year 2000, the pastor stood in the pulpit and preached from Matthew chapter 13 on the wheat and the tear. And I heard God said, you've been living a lie. You've been looking like a wheat, but you ain't a wheat. And it's time to change. And I met Jesus on August the 22nd, 2000. And that's the day I have to remind Satan often. Uh Uh-uh. Amen. No more. Amen. The next day I was baptized, the next day I turned 20. So those, those three days are very significant in my life, Amen. and I have to remind myself, specifically Satan, uh-uh, not anymore. Amen. What a great rock. Well, when I was nine years old in a little white country church, I was sitting on the back row with three or four of my friends, and of course, us boys was acting up, so we uh, sang some songs, and then the preacher started preaching, and something caught my ear. So I started listening to him, and it touched my heart that he was talking about me. So whenever they uh, opened it, sang the song I came down and my mom and aunt and a lot of people paid for me and the Lord saved my soul and he has blessed me 
and many, many blessings. Amen. Thank you, Gary. Um, I grew up, I guess, with what you would call a religious house in the sense that, you know, by the world standard, we went to church every Sunday. But Monday through Saturday, there wasn't a Bible opened at all. Um, no discussion of the Lord. It was just, you know, my whole high school and upbringing was more about outward appearances. You know, did you look like a good person? Were you a good person? Did you go to church? It didn't matter if you slept through it or anything as long as you were there in the pews. Um, and so that's how I, I grew up. And then I went to college. And because I didn't have the Lord in my heart, um, when I went to college, I I went wild. I went to, you know, fell in with a group of friends, and we just, you know, we wanted to do whatever we could get up to while we were in college. And um, But I had all the stories and just the upbringing, you know, even though I thought I wasn't paying attention, everything in the background was somewhere, you know, somewhere in my mind, somewhere in my heart. But... Um, I really just had this pulling that, similar to a cartoon, when you have the words above the characters, I just felt like everybody, instead of words, could see my sin. Mm. And um, when I came to realize, it was the Holy Spirit telling me that he knew my sin. You know, people couldn't see my sin because I was... I was at West Point. I was this great young man, but um, that wasn't the case. Um, so sitting at my desk in in what we call the divisions, where you know where my room was, I asked the Lord into my heart. I asked Him to be my Savior. Amen. And um, it's just been a blessing. It hasn't been, you know, I don't have this weight, I guess, that I had at, at the time just over me, um, afraid of what people would know. You know, I've let it all go. He's freed me from that burden. Amen. And um, he's blessed me. It hasn't been, you know, a perfect life. I've had to go through things. He's disciplined me when I needed discipline, and I'm thankful for that. Amen. And I just know that, you know, I feel, I feel blessed just to have him in my life. Amen. Amen. When I was four years old, my birth mother passed away with a brain aneurysm. And so I would spend my summers with my grandparents, and I'd spend the rest of the time during the school year with my, my father and my stepmother. And when I spent my summers with my grandmother, the seeds were planted. We were at church every time the door opened. Sunday school consisted of me and my great aunt, which was my great grandmother's sister. Um, and that was it. Um, so the seed was planted, but even then we didn't talk. We, we read about Bible stories and, you know, King Solomon and the two women fighting over the baby and things like that. And um, I never really got a good dose of Jesus. We didn't talk about him in my home. Uh, when I was 16, uh, I did. I was motivated by what every 16 boy, 16 year old boy was motiv motivated by. A girl invited me to church, uh, and I started going to church. And I went, I went by myself and, and started going more and more. And the more I heard, the more I liked, the more I got curious, the more I started asking questions. Um, the pastor also took an interest in me and, and kind of motivated me and, and mentored me along. Um, August 19th, 1997, in the foyer of Baxter Baptist Church, which is right down the road, um, at the end of a week where a group of college missionaries had come and spent the week with us and talked to us about a lot of different things, a lot of different topics, uh, a, I say a boy, a, a college man named Chris Druin, um, stood in that foyer with me, with me bawling. Uh, like Tony said, it's funny what you remember. I, I still remember what I was wearing. Uh, it was a large shirt back then, those fit. Um, 
And uh, I gave my heart to Christ. And for a while, I lived the way a Christian should. But then for different reasons and, and, and different mistakes, I fell out of that. And then uh, I met a girl that I wanted to marry. And after the second date, she invited me to church, which I hadn't been going. And something told me that that wasn't a question, it was more of a command. And so I started coming to Faith Fellowship Church. After a while, I rededicated my life in the very building that I used to stop for catfish on the way home from church as a teenager. Once I let go and once I surrendered and gave Christ my life, it's, it's incomparable. It, it, it doesn't compare to the life that I was living before. I don't have it all figured out. I, I told my guys in life group this morning, there are times and days where I still have trouble surrendering, surrendering at all. But I'm getting there, I hope. And so I urge any, each and every one of you, don't make the mistake of falling away like I did. It is so much sweeter on this side. Man, I didn't realize how much my testimony went along with, with these guys, and I've heard them before, but it just, it, it's crazy. Um, I did not grow up in a Christian home, or my mom thought she was a Christian, but there sure weren't any fruits or anything, and we def definitely didn't go to church on Sunday. And uh, she did her best. She sent me to camp every year, Pine Cove Christian Camp in Tyler, a fantastic camp. And there was one, one summer where everybody in my cabin wanted to give their heart to Christ. And I was like, well, heck, if they're doing it, I'm going to do that. That looks kind of fun, you know. The, all, my, all the guys are doing it. And uh, I guess I was a middle schooler then. And, man, I thought I had it made. I was like, man, this is it. I'm a Christian now. This is good. All these good things. It's going to be great. And then I went back to school that fall, and I was a good kid. And, you know, the ne next few years into high school, um, I jokingly say, and I, I say this, but there was people at my school at, out at La Pointer that told my mom, say, hey, have, can you have Dante hang out with my kid? Because he's a good kid, and I want him to be like, like Dante. Man, they didn't know. They didn't know at all what I was doing. You know, the words that were coming out of my mouth, the things I was viewing, the things that I shouldn't have been a part of. But to them, and to what I thought I was fooling God, I was a good guy. I was a good kid. I was a really good kid. Well, then I went home school. I got out of the school system, and I uh, went to a homeschool Christian prom committee, and I met Riley. And I quickly, I quickly realized when hanging out with the Becks, they had something that I've never felt. What they had in their home, just, I've never experienced. I didn't realize how confused, how lost, how absolutely just lost, lost I was. I thought I had it all. I was the good kid. But I realized that though they're not perfect, and they'll tell you that, but golly, it sure was great what I was experiencing when I was there. And I wanted that really bad. <coughs> well, then fast forward a little bit, and I ended up ended up coming to church here off and on. And then um, I got with I got with Riley, and we were good friends. And as soon as I could, I, I got with his sister Skylar, and <laughs> you know, so we we started dating in June of 2014, and kept coming to church because. I knew I, I knew I needed to be there, but but I also wanted to sit next to my girlfriend every Sunday. And this church, the pews were different then, or the chairs were different, but right over there, Bauer Patrick's sitting, and I uh, was sitting next to my girlfriend. I guess I was, this was nine years ago in October, so this is a good month for me. And, um, and I just started bawling. I, like Seth was saying, I mean, the Holy Spirit came upon me, sitting right next to my girlfriend, who, you know, I gotta be that strong, a strong boyfriend. 
I couldn't control it. I was bawling, crying. I, and I was like, what is this? Like, what are these things? You know, like, yeah. like, and of course, they all knew exactly what was going on. Everybody around me knew what was going on. Pastor knew what was going on. <laughs> and, and then Skyler and all of them said, why don't you talk to Tony after this, uh, after this service? And, and sure enough, October of 2014, in his office right back there, he took my hand and it, it, he prayed with me and said, look, if there's anything that I say, and he's, he's mentioned it before, you know, we know it now, he said, if there's anything I say that you don't believe or don't feel, you squeeze my hand and we'll talk about it. And I felt every word that he said. And I didn't even know those words, but, but they, came, they came directly to my heart. And, and, and that was 2014, right? So that's been nine years. And the Lord has more than blessed me since then. I mean, I, the fact that I'm a, this, this title of, of deacon means nothing to, to me, but means everything to the Lord and, and the opportunity that, that he allowed me to, to do this. And, you know, I was, I was that kid sitting with his girlfriend right there. You know, and now th the Lord has, has allowed me to serve in the church on so many um, ways, and I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful to be here in this church. It sounds like a common denominator of girls. So Michelle asked me out when I was 16. Hey, I'd be single today if she hadn't asked me out. But I wanted to be—I wanted to spend time with her, and her family went to church there in uh, near DeSoto, and um, they taught first grade, and so I didn't really go to Sunday school at first grade. So I started hearing what they were teaching to the first graders as a uh, 16-year-old, and the Lord began just doing things in my life. I, I was going to go to school and be in science, and I didn't believe in God. I—I. I, uh, was an atheist, I believed in evolution and all that stuff. And as uh, time went on, Michelle decides that she's gonna go to Nacogdoches to college. And I'm like, well, I'm not gonna go to a party school, I'm gonna go to uh, University of Texas at Arlington where I was at, I'm a scientist. I followed her to Nacogdoches <laughs> and, <clears throat> you know, I kept up a pretense, everyone would have assumed, all of our friends, our common friends, assumed I was a Christian. But I knew I wasn't. So I get into a dorm there, and I walk in, and my roommate, he's not there, but he's got posters all around. It says Christian cowboys and saddles and all this. And I'm like, okay, okay, I see where this is going. Uh, all the friends and now my roommate, I see what the Lord's doing. But what happened was I had been there not very long. It's probably before school started, and somebody from the BSF came over, and um, I don't remember what they said. But I remember this, and he said, if you were to die tonight, where would you spend eternity? Yeah. Well, I was bawling like a baby, but I answered, I go to heaven, I go to heaven. But I knew absolutely that I was going to go to hell. And, and see, I think that's a, that's a problem with a lot of people uh, in trying to understand this is because hell is not really presented well. Jesus talks about it 60 some odd times in scripture more than anything else he talks about hell it's a real place and so just shortly after that the church that I was going with all the Christians and I was a pretend Christian had a revivalist come in there in Nacogdoches and I don't remember what he said his name was Billy Foote I remember that East Texas evangelist and I went down the aisle blathering and this youth guy the youth minister, he draws, uh, it's like the song we sang, he drew the two cliffs, and he put God on one side and me on the other. And he was trying to explain there's this chasm between me and God. And then he draws a cross as Jesus is the bridge. I didn't get it. He wads it up and does it again. Okay, so God on this side, you're on this side, here's a chasm, here's a cross. Jesus, he came across to get you. It's over my head. And I've, <laughs> I've been going to church with my, my girlfriend all this time. He draws it again. And I finally, I, I started to understand. But I'll be honest with you. At 20 years old, I'm 20 by this point. This is September 12th of 84. He says, um, or I, I know that I need Jesus, but I don't really know why. And so I think it's so important when Paul says you need to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So over the last 40, 39, 40 years, 
the Lord has revealed things. I believed as a child, just like it says, have the faith of a child. I had that faith, but that's about all I had. And so it's over time that I've understood 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin. I was never, I say it was, it was probably preached, I just did not understand. My grandfather baptized me. He was a Southern Baptist preacher, so after I got saved, he baptized me. And I remember standing in the uh, baptistry saying, well, I was a pretty good kid. Because I didn't have that background, that wild living, the drinking of the drugs, and I didn't really have that. I, I saw the people that had those kind of backgrounds, and I'm like, man, that's a good testimony, man. That really, yeah, I see where God saved them. But I was just a pretty good kid. He made him who knew no sin to be sin. So for those of you that think, oh, I'm pretty good, we're filthy. There, Paul says there's no one good. There is no one who is righteous, no one who seeks good. And so that was me. And as I've worked out my salvation, not work like I'm doing things, but I'm working it out. He talks about obedience right before that. I'm becoming more obedient. I'm coming to understand what Jesus did when he died for me. He took on all of the sins that I committed and was so disgusting to the Father that the Father turned his face away. And he was crucified for me and for you. And so that's, that's my testimony that Tony asked us to give three to five minutes. And I'm thinking, how do you narrow down 40 years into three to five minutes? But that's what it boils down to. My testimony is what Jesus did for me. So now, as it said, I think in the first song, I call him Lord and Master because he's my Savior. Amen. All right. Men, go ahead and make your way down. If you're going to serve, stay on the front row if you would. Now, these men have come and they've dropped their rock of remembrance here forever. A testimony of what God did for them and in them. This morning, if it had just been random and I'd have just looked across and I'd have picked out some people, you're members of Faith Fellowship Church and uh, we've talked before and uh, I think as far as I know, you're saved. And if I'd have called you and said, hey, come on up here. Did you have a testimony to share? Do you have a time of remembrance where the Spirit of God convicted you of your sin? You felt the shame of your sin and out of regret, and the conviction of that, you repented and asked God to forgive you. Amen. And trusted in the blood of Christ and His death on Calvary to save you from your sin. And today, you're saved. Maybe I'm talking to somebody this morning, you don't have that testimony and you're really glad I didn't do what I just suggested. Well, maybe this morning, in just a moment when we give an invitation, the Spirit of God has shown you what all of these men said, I realized I was lost. Maybe there's been a lot of confusion, but the one thing you're sure about is today I am not a Christian, and if Christ were to come or I were to die, I would go to hell forever. And you know that for sure. I'm going to invite you in just a moment to come. Be glad to pray with you as you invite Christ in, repenting of sin and believing on Him that you might be saved. We'd be glad to do that with you this morning. The next time we have a testimony time, you can stand up and say, when those deacons dropped their rock of remembrance, they landed on me. And now I've got a rock of remembrance of the day I was saved. In just a moment as we have our invitation, one of the commands of Paul to the church at Corinth is that before we have the supper, he says, let each one of us examine ourselves." That self-examination is to prepare our hearts to, to take the supper in a righteous way. As we hold the body and think about His body broken, as we hold the cup and think about His blood, that we realize He did that to cleanse us from our sin. And that we would wash our hearts as we get ready to come to the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table. We put an empty chair at the head of the table to remind us that it's the Lord's Supper, not Faith Fellowship. It's certainly not Tony's. It's 
take the Lord's Supper. One day he promised that he was going to do it again with us in heaven and that chair is going to be occupied and he's going to be there and we're going to join him there in heaven around the supper. You don't have to be a member of Faith Fellowship Church to partake in the supper. It's the Lord's Supper. The only thing we would remind you of is it is a supper of remembrance of our salvation. If you've never been born again and accepted Christ as Savior and order of your life, it would be an unworthy thing for you to do to take that which represents His body and His blood and internalize them when you've not done that in your heart. So we'd say if you're not a believer, just pass the elements right on by and uh, may they be a witness to you of your need for Christ. So Brother Tony, I'm not saved, but what if I come get saved before the supper? then you'd be completely equipped to take it. And we'd invite you to. In just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation for those two things. For someone who doesn't know Christ to come and receive Him as Savior and Lord of their life. And for us to have a time of examination. It can be there in your seat if you want to come to the altar. The invitation is open for you to do that. We're going to have just a time to prepare our hearts, to examine ourselves, allow the Holy Spirit Maybe He's going to convict us of particular sins that we need to repent and forsake. Whatever it is the Holy Spirit wants to say, we're going to give Him that opportunity. So I'm going to ask you if you would to join me as we pray. We're going to have this time of invitation. I'm going to say a word of prayer, and after that, the invitation is going to be open, and you respond however the Lord has spoken to your heart. Now, Father, as we give this time...